Welcome to another Dr. Sadler's Honest Book Review. This is a series in which I provide unvarnished and in-depth and detail reviews of recent works, mostly in philosophy, but in connected fields as well. So understanding philosophy rather broadly to include cultural criticism, ethics, critical thinking, leadership studies, personal development, and all sorts of other things. Today I'm doing something a bit different. I am reviewing this book, which is actually coming out today. This is an advanced copy that I got of it. Verissimus, meaning most truthful. The subtitle is The Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. And it is by two people, Donald Robertson, the author, the, the one who's putting words into the mouths of the characters, and then an illustrator, uh, J. Nuno Fraga, who uh, collaborated with Donald to produce this really quite beautiful volume. And it is uh, really quite something to look at. But I'll tell you all about that as we go through the style and structure, main points, good things and problematic aspects, and then wrap up with some final thoughts. I always begin these book reviews by talking about three S's. That is a summary of the work, the style of the work, and the structure of the work. And here I think, you know, when we talk about style and structure, the fact that it is a graphic novel really is, you know, of, of central importance. There are these chapter headings like the one you see here, The Most Truthful Child, and each of these chapter headings begins with a quotation from Marcus Aurelius um, and, you know, then has this gorgeous, beautiful, you know, comic style thing with thought bubbles and narration and words being exchanged between people. And, you know, as it is with graphic novels, much of what is happening takes place through the dialogue between the characters or their interior monologue. So, you know, it's, it's a sequential, you could say, novelization of the life, but also the lessons and the thought of Marcus Aurelius, one of the good emperors, there weren't a hell of a lot of them, of Rome, and also a Stoic philosopher uh, who left behind uh, not only a lot of deeds and words as part of his legacy that other people recorded, but a very popular book, uh, one that's, that's quite often read as sort of a representative of Stoicism, which we typically translate as meditations, but is actually written to himself. And so that plays a really central role in this. Um, I would say, you know, so it's, it's called the Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. And one of the main goals of Robertson and his illustrator is to get across some of the key ideas, some of the key teachings of Stoic philosophy. So you're going to see Seneca brought up and actually not mentioned as such really, although some of his ideas are being used, and then Epictetus and others as well. So there's a lot of putting things coming from Stoic literature into the mouths of characters. For example, teachers, philosophical teachers, that Marcus himself is going to have as important in his life. And there's a lot of really cool vignettes, we could call them, uh, where we see something being talked about, being illustrated. So here's a, here's a great uh, image right here where the emperor himself is afraid of, of death. But there's a great one in here with um, Hercules. Um, there's others where other interesting things are going on. So here is a depiction of um, the, the storm-tossed boat at sea and the stoic sage or, you know, wise person or 
philosopher at least who is um, you know showing fear to some degree in this case it's um, Apollonius of Chalcedon, the professor of Stoicism who teaches in Athens. And so there's, there's lots of interesting little sections like that that kind of break it up. Um, there are a number of different um, chapters that are focusing on particular themes and topics. If you look at the table of contents, it kind of runs you through what is actually going on in this, you know, the most truthful child, the Stoic master, the Empress Faustina, the, leg the legionary legate, the Parthian war, the temple of Apollo, the Antonine plague, we could go on and on and on. And each of these is detailing something important that is taking place. A lot of these are uprisings and wars that Marcus himself has to be involved in. And it winds up, you know, ending with this, the view from above. Now, I should also mention when it comes to uh, structure that there is a preface to it. Um, and, you know, Donald is, is talking here about uh, his process and the work that he did and how he ended up uh, collaborating with this uh, young Portuguese illustrator, J. Nuna Fraga. Um, he says the book isn't intended as an introduction to Stoic philosophy, how to think like a Roman emperor and Stoicism, the art of happiness, do that quite well. Instead, we choose to do something completely new by presenting Marcus's philosophical precepts and psychological techniques in a more concrete way, placing them within the context of real events from his life. We show how Stoicism influenced some of his decisions as Roman emperor and helped him to cope with the many challenges he faced. Um, there is also uh, two other things towards the end of the book. There's an appendix, uh, which has to do with anger. And then there is um, an afterword as well. And these are both pretty short. Um, they don't you know, detract from the structure of the work, which is mostly all graphic novel. So that's probably enough by way of talking about the three S's. What are some of the key ideas? Now, I'm not going to do a run through of all the different stoic concepts and practices that are coming up in this. Instead, what are some of the key ideas in the work itself? The one thing I'll say to begin with is the work begins after we get past, you know, uh, the, the preliminary stuff in the table of contents. With an emperor dying, the year is 180 AD, the emperor Marcus Aurelius lies dying of plague in the legionary camp at Vindobana in the Roman province of Pannonia. And here we, we see him in his bed, coughing, spitting up blood, dying. And what do we have at the very end of the work, uh, in addition to this beautiful uh, set of... of uh, plates that are the view from above. Just before that, we have the emperor who is on his last legs, coming back, uh, paying mem respect to his mem memory of his, his tutor and in, in a crypt. Um, and that's, that's essentially where it's ending, right? We have the full cycle of Marcus Aurelius's life and some of the most important things that happened in it. Um, we start the narrative itself with little Marcus getting called Verissimus, the title of the book, by his grandfather and starting on a path, a path of moral goodness, of earnestness, of taking on the responsibilities that are thrust upon him in order to try to make the immediate surroundings and the people he's in charge of, and then the Roman Empire itself, and even the world itself, a better place. And we get to see his character coming through significantly, I would say, in the storytelling that's going on. Now, as I mentioned already, a significant part of this, as was a significant part of Marcus Aurelius's life, 
is concerned with conflict, with wars, with dealing with crises. So, you know, who does he face? Who does Rome face? Well, the Parthians are a big part of that. The, you know, resurgent Persian empire that is jockeying with Rome over Mesopotamia and Armenia uh, and, and other, you know, Syria, other border lands. Uh, a significant part of the, the warfare is going on there. We also have the Sarmatians, who are descended supposedly from the Scythians, another warlike people. And then we could say taking the greatest place until, of course, the civil war that's going to happen, we have the Germans, various German tribes, a number of them, some of whom Rome is allied with, some of whom are enemies of Rome, and they are up there on the northern and western frontiers. And there's, you know... Uh, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made. Can we deal with this issue over here? Well, we have to pull troops from here, and then these people over here start to see us as easy prey. Complicating it even more, one of the things that comes back from Persia is a plague, a pestilence, a pandemic that begins to ravage people throughout the Roman Empire and in other places as well. There's also um, several, you know, characters who play a major role. Uh, Marcus has a brother, Lucius, who's kind of a screw-up, and he tries to make him effectively co-emperor, and that's really not working out because Lucius not only doesn't have the talent for it, he doesn't have the guts. He doesn't have the drive. He doesn't have the care of other people. He's interested mostly in drinking and enjoying himself and bossing people around. And then we have a noble, um, you know, very competent military commander, Ovidus Cassius, who eventually will uh, effectively start a civil war, taking uh, parts of the Roman Empire and declaring himself the, you know, the ruler of those. Well, Marcus is still alive, but perhaps, you know, Avidus doesn't, Cassius doesn't know this. So there's questions about all this. So we, a lot of this is concerned with the battlefield and what's going on. And we get to see the horrors of war, not just those that are being imposed by these barbarians, but what the Romans themselves also do as well. There's even a tower where all these uh, German men are, you know, lashed to it, and it is set on fire to try to show the Germans that you'd better not mess with Rome, <coughs> which, you know, certainly makes an impression. Um, you know, we see Roman rulers as themselves tyrants driven by their passions, particularly that of anger, but also driven by their fears as well. An exception to this would be Antonius, who Marcus uh, is, is, you know, uh, being brought up by. We see here, this is part of it, Antonius differed from Hadrian in almost every way. His next act was to make the succession clearer by naming me Caesar and betrothing his youngest daughter Faustina to me. He was cheerful and easygoing. The Senate loved him because he treated them with respect and willingly shared power with them. He showed me that even in a palace one could live simply and unpretentiously. He says, remove these statues and other ornaments from my room. Dismiss the guards. I won't be needing them. Marcus goes on, he deliberated carefully, taking his time over important matters. However, once he was satisfied with his decision, he would act with great focus and determination. He neither flattered others nor sought to win praise himself. No one would ever dream of calling him a sophist, unlike Hadrian, who is pretentious, flippant, and pedantic. He welcomed criticism and always listened patiently to the opinions of those with more wisdom and experience. Despite being emperor, he never considered himself superior to anyone else. Reassured by his example, I therefore resolved to become Antonius's disciple in all things, both as a man and as a statesman. This is what is being depicted in this set of passages. So we get to see these, these startling contrasts between how rule reveals the, the human being 
behind the ruler, how it shows the character of the person, why people in fact take on rulership. So those are some of the main ideas, but you can also say that running throughout the entire thing, of course, Stoic philosophy, lots and lots of Stoic teachings, little applications, and even practices coming in. For example, the ending chapter, the view from above, right, which is uh, a practice that modern Stoics have named, but which comes from Marcus Aurelius. Take a bird's eye view of the world, its endless gatherings and ceremonies, countless journeys in both storm and calm, and the transformation of things coming to be, at being, and then ceasing to be. Now that's only a, an abbreviated version, but it gives you an idea about what's going on there. So those are some of the main ideas of the work. There are a lot of good points to this work. I'm not myself a big graphic novel person. As a matter of fact, I think I only own two, this one and Loja Comic, which I think I may have lent out to somebody else. So, you know, you're getting something from somebody who prefers to read books and hasn't spent much time reading comic books since I was in the army over 30 years ago. I think this is great. I think that it's a very compelling telling of the story of Marcus Aurelius. It's not, it is about, you know, Stoic philosophy, but it's not being didactic in how it's presenting it. It's providing you another in, a, a way of connecting with it through the life of somebody who was deeply structured in his motivations in his judgments in his actions but also fell short from time to time uh, by stoic philosophy marcus aurelius and so the story itself is you know very coherent makes a lot of sense um, beautiful beautiful graphics i do want to um, show you a few of these and hopefully they come through well and i want to begin with this final um, chapter, the view from above. The first plate of it has three uh, sections. Um, you know, Marcus says, go to the rising sun for I am already setting. He's dying himself. And then um, there's some teachings. And look at these gorgeous, gorgeous drawings, uh, illustrations. They're not just drawings. They're, they're paintings as well. They're illustrated, right? Uh, on each of the pages, these so, you know, good symbolism and, you know, artistically compelling, beautiful, drawing you in. Um, here we see two more as well. And then here are the final ones, the owl the bird of Minerva, the bird of wisdom, and the setting sun. Um, Fraga is certainly a, a, an amazing artist, and so this is uh, really quite good. It, it conveys, I would also say this is another good point, it conveys the complexity of not just the history but the commitments, the decisions, the characters, the relationships of the people who are characters within the story. You know, think about Faustina, for example, who has to endure slander and gossip about her and who wants to spend more time with Marcus, admires him as a human being, but realizes that he's stuck being emperor, being out on the frontiers, dealing with problems to be solved over and over and over again. We, we could look at, uh, you know, the other emperors. We can look at the complex character of Cassius, who's not just a bad guy who wants to, you know, take his piece. He's, he's trying to figure out what to do. And so we see a lot of this going on. I would also say another really good point of this is that we see Marcus teaching by example. And who is he teaching? He's teaching his fellow Romans. 
He's teaching himself as well and trying to respond to what his teachers gave him to work with. And he's teaching us. We see Marcus having to deal with his own anger, recognizing the danger that it poses as he sees it in other people, realizing his own failings to to deal with it and trying to do better over and over again, showing mercy, giving people the benefit of the doubt. These are all sort of lessons that are being taught in there. And I, I really think that the appendix and the afterword are pretty awesome. I mean, so in the appendix, um, Donald tells you that one of the biggest things that he saw Marcus struggling with is indeed anger. And then he gives you this um, important passage uh, from uh, the Meditations, Book 11, Chapter 18, uh, these 10 gifts of the muses, which are supposed to be healing us of our anger. And these are some, you know, passages that you can read through yourself and then you can go to the uh, meditations and, and find where they are. The afterword is really great too. Um, he tells us depiction of Roman history in such detail always presents challenges. For example, in relation to military uniforms and equipment, we sought feedbacks on that, but our priority was to serve the story rather than slavishly maintain historical accuracy. And then he says, here's the creative decisions we made. Language. We're using the language coming from uh, historical sources as best we can. Uh, he tells us about the sources. And then he's got a section on creative liberties, acknowledging that, yes, this is not history exactly as it happened. There are a few liberties taking place. For example, Avidus Cassius probably wasn't made governor of Syria until around AD 166, whereas we have it happening three years earlier in 163 to simplify the sequence of events following the death of Marcus Annius Libio. Um, he talks about controversies that um, he, he didn't uh, get into too much. Um, one of these has to do with whether Marcus is a warmonger or genocide engager because of the Marcomannic Wars. And he says, listen, I'm, I hope that we've shown you that this war was pretty brutal on both sides. Then the second controversy is about Marcus persecuting Christians and... Um, Donald says, this accusation is often repeated on the internet, even in some books. There's really no credible evidence to suggest he was personally responsible for such persecutions. Indeed, several independent pieces of evidence suggest the contrary was true. Tertullian actually calls Marcus a protector of Christians. Um, interestingly, he could have mentioned Justin Martyr, who dedicates his apology to Marcus, right, as well. Uh, and then there's Commodus. This is another key issue. Commodus is Marcus's son who is, is made, um, you know, Caesar runner up, you could say, and then takes over the empire. And, um, you know, Donald has some, some pretty clear views on why Marcus chose Commodus. He says this question is, is rather complex. I've tried to touch on historical details that relate to it at various points in the stories. Um, a lot of people wanted him to make Commodus the emperor uh, heir apparent, right? And it, it probably would have destroyed the empire to switch things up quickly. It could have led to civil war to not do that. So those are some, you know, I, I would say some really solid points about this book. Um, it's well-researched. It's uh, setting things into a very uh, good narrative for, for taking all of this in. It makes sense. Is there anything problematic about this work? I would say that the answer in general is no. And there's a few things where one might quibble a bit and say, yes, you, you kind of did take some liberties. You made some choices that I'm not sure I would actually go along with. Um, one of these has to do with, here's the image of the slave who has been cast into the pool of eels, right? And the question is, well, what are these eels? And, and one way of trying to make sense of this is to say that they were lampreys, which are a type of, of fish that has these, you know, sucker teeth and stuff like that. 
The trouble is, is that lampreys don't kill people. And so, you know, explaining this hor horrible, horrific episode, which the Emperor Augustus put an end to, where um, uh, Vettius Polio, a man of enormous wealth, influence and extravagant taste, kept a, spawn, a pond stocked with writhing lampreys fattened to be served at his dinner table. The loathsome beast cla clasps its mouth on the body of its victims, boring its tongue into their flesh to drink their blood. So he keeps this, this pool and he throws slaves who displease him in there. Um, are they really lampreys? Well, other sources tell us no. And it's much more likely that they were actually um, eels, specifically moray eels. You notice that I have Seneca's um, Anger, Mercy, Revenge volume here, and this is from the On Clemency, where the story is actually told about this. Who did not hate Vettius Polio more keenly than his slaves did for fattening his mores on human blood and ordering those who had given some offense to be thrown into a fish pond filled with eels. The man deserved to die a thousand times, whether, to feeding, whether for feeding slaves to mores intended to feed him in turn or for raising eels only with the aim of feeding them this way, right? And so, you know, are they more, are they mores, are they lampreys? It's more likely that they were mores if the goal was to actually kill people. But again, kind of a little quibble, right? Um, another one comes up here where we see um, Marcus being given these rare scrolls. I want you to have these rare scrolls, my son. They contain the unpublished discourses of Epictetus, the philosophers written down by my old friend Arian. Take them, Marcus, and begin to model your life on the teachings they contain. Now, it's clear that Marcus did, in fact, read Epictetus um, and, you know, found him to be very helpful in understanding Stoicism. Were the discourses not published by that time or were they already circulating? Yeah, you know, we don't really, really know, but to assert that they were definitely unpublished, yeah, that's a little bit of a stretch. Um, there's also kind of a conflation going on in the Roman triumph. Uh, you know, this is something where we don't have solid historical evidence to confirm or to deny. But here's what happens. So, you know, Marcus and his, his brother are coming back. Lucius and I rode in triumph through the streets of Rome as imperial slaves stood at our backs, whispering memento mori in our ears. Look towards your death and remember you are mortal. Remember you must die. Um, fathers of our country, they're saying, we knew it not that day, but along his hall of Parthian slaves and treasure, Luthus had brought something back, death, right? So now memento mori is a phrase that does get used by modern day Stoics. It is not one, as far as we know, that actually originates with the Stoics. The earliest attestations of something like that are in Tertullian, um, who's a, a Christian author and says that, you know, an emperor would, would have his slave tell him, you know, memento, but not memento mori, memento meaning remember, be mindful of, the fact that you are a human being and therefore you will die. Again, kind of a quibble, you know, um, could Marcus have had somebody doing that? Yes. But it's a little bit inaccurate to frame it as saying memento mori, right? Remember death or remember that you must die. But these are all pretty minor points. And I don't think they detract at all from the book as a whole. Do I recommend this book? I do, in fact, recommend it unqualifiedly. I think it's a great book for everybody to have. Even if you know Stoic philosophy quite well, you've been practicing and studying it for years, you will definitely get something out of seeing Marcus Aurelius, the great Stoic emperor, being depicted in the way that he is with the, the gorgeous illustrations and the very you know well-thought-out storytelling and 
narrative. I would like to show you something from it. Those of you who already have read Aurelius's Meditations or those of you who may be about to do that, we find him engaging in that in the book. So the book is in the book, right? Meanwhile, at Carnatum, I searched my thoughts. Who will guide me now? Well, if I can no longer speak or even write letters to you, Rusticus, the best of my masters, I must become my own tutor, write to myself, say something to myself. And we see the very first part of book two, Say to yourself at the start of each day, I will meet with meddling, ungrateful, violent, treacherous, envious, and unsociable people. They are prone to all these defects because they lack the knowledge of what is good and what is bad. This is the very beginning of book two of the meditations. So we get that depicted here. I, I highly recommend this, and I'm just going to stop here with that recommendation saying, awesome book. You should check it out.